So really, hi, hi. I'm Melissa Loka. Uh, I, I know. Really yes. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Hi. Yeah. So. I'm sorry? You ladies first for the opening remarks. Uh, I like to, I'll round it out. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and get started with our final panel of the day. Thanks so much for sticking with us. We've got a really exciting one. And in order to, uh, to get started, I'm just going to pass it right over to Lydia from Orderplex Alliance, who is the Vice President in Charge of Human Capital and Education Initiatives in the Ciudad Juarez, El Paso area. Uh, so a perfect person to moderate this panel for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you to the Wilson Institute for inviting us. I am happy to be here and delighted to present this panel. Um, throughout the day, we've been talking about trade across border regions and uh, efficiencies on those border crossings. But the one thing that I think is essential for all these border crossings to occur is, of course, talent and the creation of talent. We have talked about uh, how much our trade uh, has increased. Uh, I heard somebody this morning say about 550%. Well, my question would then be, what has happened with human talent in, in that area? Has everybody really invested that much in doing a bicultural, bilingual workforce to attend to these demands? So this panel really concentrates on how we'll be, be addressing and uh, what the experiences of these three honorable, I am very honored to be sitting in this table with these three individuals that are uh, doing a lot on uh, education initiatives. So to start off with and just uh, set the ground rules, I do want to uh, first let each of our panelists tell us a little bit about what they're doing in the education field and what they've accomplished. So um, let me start off with Rebecca Vargas. And uh, uh, we recently all met. Uh, so I will let them tell you about the exciting things that each of them are doing. Uh, additional to that, you can also read their bios in your packet. So Rebecca, please. 
Gracias, Lidia, and thank you also to the Wilson Center for the invitation. I'm happy to share the panel with you. Um, at the, the U.S. Mexico Foundation is a non-for-profit organization. We are a 501c3 in the, based in the U.S., but also with offices in Mexico. And we are an organization that focuses on promoting binational cooperation and understanding. And we do this through educational programs, educational programs focused on three areas. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, civic engagement, and language acquisition. So those are the three areas where we focus, and again, all of our educational programs uh, always have a binational component. Uh, we achieve our mission in two ways. One way is by providing uh, grants to local NGOs in Mexico, and the second way is by operating programs that we, that we operate in collaboration with multiple uh, organizations, both private and, and public um, and again all of our programs are uh, binational in nature and in terms of the in terms of the the populations that we that we serve and these bicultural bilingual talent uh, you'll tell me if I'm extending the answer too much <laughs> but no, um, no, go ahead. but uh, but recently we've launched uh, several programs actually last year we launched five new programs uh, at the US Mexico Foundation and and those programs for the most part are targeting for now the the dreamer population and the Mexican American population in the US uh, at the foundation we believe that well, we believe that Hispanics are a very important workforce that is going to drive uh, the U.S. economy in the future years, if I may say it. Uh, and then in addition to the, obviously, as we know, Mexicans represent a significant percentage of this Hispanic population. And, and then if we keep uh, talking about that population, in particular, the dreamer population, it's a population that we believe uh, has a lot of potential um but it, but needs to be empowered as you all know the dreamers are the young individuals who came to this country brought by their parents usually at a very young age they attended school in the u.s they they embrace the american values in their heart and their minds they are more americans maybe than mexicans but they still have the mexican culture on the mexican background so for the u.s mexico foundation uh, we have two goals uh, in terms of working with the with them with the dreamer population and the young mexican americans in the US. The first goal is to empower them, empower them so that they achieve their, their full potential uh, and they grow and continue to contribute to the US economy. And at the same time, and th that's our second goal. At the same time, they keep in their hearts and mind a space for Mexico so that they become uh, promoters and unofficial ambassadors of, of, uh, of more collaboration and, and a better, closer relationship between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, so that's said quickly and maybe a lot. Uh, sorry, Lydia, but, uh, but again, that's the population that we focus on and that's uh, who we are in general. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I'll, I'll come back to you in a bit. And uh, Melissa, if you'd like to just uh, chime in and tell us what uh, you're doing on your part of war. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon with everyone. I'm Melissa Floca. I'm the interim director at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies, which is based at UC San Diego at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We're a um, university-based research center, and we've been on campus for about 35 years. We run a fellowship program where we invite a dozen or so scholars each year to UCSD. Uh, many of them are, are young scholars who we think are doing the most innovative work on Mexico and on Mexicans in the U.S. and on U.S.-Mexico relations. In addition to that, we have a wide variety of our own research projects. I'll be telling you about one of them today. And we uh, engage in research that we think can inform better policies that can help improve the quality of life of Mexicans and Mexicans in the U.S., and also improve the impact of um, binational policy. In addition to that, we host um, dialogues similar to this one, many public policy dialogues and events throughout the year where, where we bring people to the border to have conversations similar to the one that we're having here today, and so hopefully we'll see some of the folks from D.C. Um, in San Diego before too long. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, our third um, presenter is uh, Congressman Hurd. I am happy to go ahead and 
have you talk about all the initiatives that you're doing in our part of the world. <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm Will Hurd. I'm born and raised in San Antonio. Got a degree in computer science in, at Texas A&M University and spent nine and a half years as an undercover officer in the CIA. Um, helped start a cybersecurity company and then been, been uh, in Congress for about 16 months. Um, I represent from San Antonio to El Paso down to Eagle Pass, 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. It takes 10 and a half hours to drive from one corner to the other at 80 miles an hour, um, which I learned recently is not the speed limit in all of Texas. <laughs> um, and, you know, as, as, as the member of Congress that represents more border than anybody else, um, these issues are, are important. And as a, a former computer science student, you know, there are some trends that I see that are, that are alarming. For example, in 2015 in Texas, this is just tech numbers for Texas, there were 40,000 computing jobs that went unfilled. The average salary for that job, those jobs were $83,000. That's more than almost double the, the, um, the average in, for a job in Texas. Um, what's even scarier is that Texas only produced 2,100 computer scientists that year. And even scarier than that, there were only 5,000 kids that took the computer science AP course. Um, and of those 5,000, only 24% were women, um, about n a little bit over 900 were Latino, and only 120 were African American. Um, so these are, you know, I, I say computing, no matter what the job is going to be in the future, if you don't know how to code, if millennials don't know how to code, it's going to be equivalent to my generation not knowing how to type. If you're under the age of, of, of 45 and you don't know how to type, you're not going to find a job. Um, and I think that's going to be the same for computing. And so STEM education is so important, and we got to make sure that we are, are educating our, our kids in this and you know, having spent most of my <clears throat> almost of my adult life and talking about national security education is a national security issue and there's another part of education we talk about the border educating people here in Washington DC my colleagues staff and my colleagues um, there's no reason you know whenever um, I, I recently came back from a trip to Israel and I talk to my friends in the embassy there anytime there's a break in Congress there's a congressional delegation going to Israel members, staff. Why isn't that happening in Mexico? You know, why aren't the staff of all the members of the Energy and Commerce <coughs> Committee um, taking a, a CODEL uh, down to, you know, Monterey, Mexico City, you, you name it. You know, that's the kind of, uh, that's another part of education that we need to make sure that we have lawmakers that understand the relationships. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have kids, juniors in high school, spending time in, in southern Mexico, in, in Merida, wh wherever, um, to, better, to understand those connections between um, our, two, our two countries. Because the reality is we're partners, we're best friends, we're family, and we got to be thinking about that. We got to make sure our, our future generation thinks that way too. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, I will start off by saying that uh, the border region, so that we can chat a little about that, and then I'm going to turn it over to a small presentation here. Um, just uh, we all need to know that that border region has the highest uh, non-English speaking students in the nation. Uh, not only are we faced with educating uh, individuals in our um, PK-12 environment, but also the fact that some of these individuals, this is their first time speaking English. The other part that is very, very important to the border is really economic disadvantage that you know sometimes we hold in these areas. Um, our students really uh, are either first time ever going to graduate uh, to either one of the universities there, and uh, therefore they need some mentoring. It's not as easy to maneuver through this, this whole thing. Um, with that said, um, I think uh, Melissa has done some research uh, on this where she has been centering on students, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, PK, well, high school students on um, both sides of the border, and it is fascinating what he, she has found out. We have a lot of similarities, but yet we have a lot of challenges. So I am going to turn it over to Melissa so that she can tell us a little bit about her findings and really tell us uh, these things that are uh, pretty much um, opportunities. I see them as opportunities. So Melissa, with that said, uh, I think you have a presentation. Thank you, Lydia. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I, I joined the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies about three and a half years ago. I grew up in New Orleans and then I spent the better part of a dozen years between Mexico and the East Coast, uh, which meant that when I arrived in San Diego, I had absolutely no idea about the border. Um, I took, I think, a whole year to even realize that I was in an incredibly dynamic cross-border metropolis. Um, neither San Diego nor Tijuana do a very good job of tooting their own horn, and I think um, the, the relationship between those two cities is not very well understood outside of the region and even pretty understudied within the region. Um, outside of this room, the narratives that we hear about the U.S.-Mexico relationship bear absolutely no resemblance to the dynamics that I see along the border. Um, and in Cali Baja, as we like to call ourselves, um, we have a, a major problem because the border bifurcates data, which means that it's very hard to tell the story about our region. And, and I think that I've come to understand that story um, as a place where we have cross-border companies, we have cross-border production processes, we have major foreign direct investment in global companies that are in advanced manufacturing. So we have aerospace, we have semiconductors, we have biotech. And these are things that people outside of the region don't understand. Um, I think we also don't do a very good job of explaining the sometimes hundreds of thousands of border crossings that happen in our community each day and the reasons why they're happening. And it's because just like our border economy operates fairly seamlessly back and forth across the border, people also live their lives on both sides of the border with just the small inconvenience of a two-hour wait when they're going back and forth. But <laughs> outside of that, they go on about their business, uh, sometimes in the U.S., sometimes in Mexico, pretty interchangeably. So over the last two years, I've started to focus much of my work on better understanding this economic relationship. Um, we've partnered with people like Sandag and Colef to better understand production sharing at the regional level and at the industry level in our, re in our very particular region. Uh, we've also worked with the Brookings Global Cities Initiative to increase bilateral exchange between San Diego and Tijuana and to help the two cities better focus on a set of economic development priorities. Um, and by no means are we alone in these efforts. There's a growing and I think an irreversible understanding in our region that our economies are inextricably linked. But workforce development is an area that's, um, I think, only catching up in that collaboration. And certainly, we really need to take into account the fact that our students are also shared back and forth across the border, and that when we think about K through 12 education and university, we also need to be collaborating at the binational level to make sure that we're supporting our students. Um, in, our, in our region, we have a very sizable cohort of students whose education takes place on both sides of the border, and these students are Perfect, perfectly well suited to, to participate in this binational economy. Um, however, supporting their educational success is not a major priority on either side of the border. We have this set of narratives that we use to talk about these students. So there are the um, students in Tijuana <coughs> whose parents drop them off at the excellent parochial schools in San Diego every morning. There are the other students from Tijuana who wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning to start their long travel to the U.S. to go to sc public schools. Students who live with families in San Diego during the week away from their parents um, so that they can attend those schools. We have first and second generation students from Mexico or from Mexican families who are looking for social mobility through education. And then we also have an increasingly and I think poorly understood group of um, U.S. citizens and dreamers who are going to Mexico when their families are deported and trying to integrate themselves into the education system there. So to better understand all of this and the uh, basically the educational trajectories and, prof and professional aspirations of these students in our region. We undertook a survey, uh, so we went to 6,000, we went to 65 schools and we, we surveyed 6,000 ninth and 10th graders. We did this in collaboration with our colleagues at Colef and UABC, uh, and we had really great cooperation from the school systems on both sides of the border because they too understand this issue as being a crucial issue for their students. Basically, what we wanted to understand was the opportunities and challenges that are caused by migration. Um, we also wanted to understand the student engagement, the non-cognitive skills, 
the 21st century skills and the academic achievement of students on the border in schools both in U.S. and, and Mexico, regardless of whether or not they, they cross the border or, or have ties to either side of the border. Um, and we did all this because we wanted to better understand the pathways to adulthood for the young people in our region. It's our hope that these research findings can inform policy solutions for policymakers in California and in Baja California to respond to the very specific needs of the shared student population because these young people represent a tremendous asset for our region and we're not investing in developing them the same way that we're investing in infrastructure and other uh, efforts of economic development and I think it's a huge mistake to separate uh, education and workforce development from economic development conversations because you can't have economic development if you're not educating the young people from your region. Uh, basically, we have a Latino education crisis in California. So uh, we have 50% Latino students in our K through 12 <laughs> classrooms. Somewhere around 77% of those students are currently graduating from high school. That's lower than almost any other um, demographic group. Of the students who are graduating, about a third of them are prepared to go to college. So that means that even the students who are graduating cannot, in most cases, go on to, to college. And so when you look at the demographic of 25 to 29-year-old Latinos in California, under 10% of them have a college education, and that's a uh, a very serious issue for us when you're looking forward at the 50% of Latino students that we have in our classrooms. I think in Mexico we have similar challenges. So you have about 50% of students in Mexico graduating from high school. You have 75% of students underperforming on math. Um, you have as many as a million students who've recently arrived in Mexico from the U.S. when their families were deported, and so I'll just say that again, as many as one million U.S. citizens or, or dreamers who are ending up in Mexico um, when their families return. And just in Baja California in K through 9, oh, I'm not showing you any of my slides. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering when that was. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just in Baja California. Uh, you have 50,000 students in K through 9 um, who have recently arrived from, from the U.S. And those students are going into classrooms where there are basically no accommodations for students who don't speak Spanish fluently. Um, in many cases, there are even bureaucratic hurdles for these students to be able to even be enrolled in classrooms. Baja is much ahead of many other parts of Mexico, but across the country um, there are tremendous challenges for these students who are already in quite precarious situations in many cases uh, just to be able to go, go to school. So um, this is obviously a tremendously important issue for the global companies that are in our community. We have economic development practitioners who've made amazing strides in creating this hub of advanced manufacturing that we have in San Diego and Tijuana. Uh, but in many cases, the young people in our region are not going to be able to take advantage of the best jobs that, those, that that economic development presents. And I think that that's really a travesty. Um, despite these tremendous challenges, what we learned in classrooms is nothing short of inspirational. Young people are amazing. Uh, teachers are truly heroes. I mean, the people that we leave our children with day in and day out deserve our utmost respect and all of the support that we can give them. Some of the things that we heard from students, um, so I'm, I'm, what I'm showing you are preliminary findings. There are probably some boogeymen still in our, in our data set. Um, they're just a subset of our data. It's uh, the Sweetwater school system and the municipal and all of the schools throughout uh, Tijuana, throughout the municipality. So we're showing you the data from the um, high school students that we talked to. It's a, a representative survey of ninth and 10th graders in the US and ninth grader, no sorry, and 10th graders in Tijuana. And what we heard from them is that they have huge dreams. So 93% um, of students that we talked to said that they think it's important to go to college. 85% of them talk about their future with their friends and 73% think that they'll earn a college degree. So when you contrast that with the fact that only 10% of Latinos in California um, who are 25 to 29 have a college degree right now, and a very small percentage of Latinos are, are even being adequately prepared to go to college, this is a heartbreaking thing to hear from kids, but also a really um, inspirational thing to hear from kids because they aspire to go to college and they understand its importance. <coughs> they live by national lives. So 
um, a quarter of them have lived or, or gone to school on the other side of the border, whether they're in the U.S. or, or in Mexico currently. Almost a third identify as being both Mexican and American. 42% think that their future will be international, and 57% have crossed the border before. 71% can speak English and Spanish at least a little, and almost 80% of them have friends um, and family who live on the other side of the border. So these kids are tremendously binational, and their lives are binational. They also faced huge barriers. So 45% of them said that they might have to leave school before they want to because of financial reasons. And over half of them, although they said they wanted to go to college, couldn't name the university that they'd like to attend. And so if you're in 10th grade and you're just two years away from university, you're certainly at a point where you, you should be able to name the university that you want to attend. Um, in many of the California classrooms that I visited, students raised their hand when they got to the survey question about the A through G requirements, which are the requirements that you have to meet to go to four-year public universities in California. And there was always a student in the room that said, what are the A through G requirements? So we're not even informing all of our students about the basic requirements to be able to think about applying to college. I think perhaps most importantly, they rely on their schools and their teachers to prepare them for the future. So across the board, they said that their teachers and their schools do a good job of preparing them for the future, which places a tremendous burden on our schools to, to live up to that expectation. And again, I think um, that teachers need more support, that counselors need more support. So we saw tremendous efforts across the board of schools to, to meet the needs of their students, but frankly, they don't have the, the resources they need to do that effectively. <clears throat> I think these results are really bittersweet. Um, when you read through the sort of 6,000 free text answers that students gave about what they want to be when they grow up um, or which university that they want to go to, it's really amazing to see that the, the dreams that kids have for themselves. But we clearly don't have policies in place to help them realize those dreams and, and to make their way through the pathways to adulthood that they aspire to. So today we've talked about cooperation and infrastructure and environment and all of these, these border issues. Um, and who better to be in these chairs a decade from now having these discussions than this wonderful group of students who grew up on the border. Uh, in San Diego and Tijuana, we have a wonderful binational template for cooperation on economic development. We have great support from companies. We have good university ties. And so we need to harness all of those relationships and, and focus them on the issue of education and workforce development so that we can help the wonderful young people that we have on the border meet the goals that they have for themselves. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much. Um, Congressman Hurd, um, I know that you have been uh, working quite a bit on the education field in vocational areas uh, throughout, um, you know, in different uh, dis different aspects. We also know that um, our workforce in the United States uh, has now is facing a problem with the fact that our later generations or older generations are more educated in numbers than our, our younger generations, which we face really a tremendous task. Um, compared to the Mexican states, uh, Mexico has, uh, although at a lower percentage, um, they have seemed to really escalate the, the, the fact that their younger workforce is more educated. Um, how do you foresee having this border uh, be a laboratory uh, to address some of those issues? Uh, that would be one of the things. How do you foresee that happening? And, um, you know, based on what you're, you've done in the past, could you share with us uh, any insight on that? Sure. I, I think it starts with how are we educating kids in, in high school um, or K through 12, really? And, and some steps are being done for that and um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, mm -hmm. This was the replacement of the No Child Left mm -hmm. Behind. Uh, there was only there's only a handful of issues that Republicans and Democrats could agree to up here in Washington D.C. and and that No Child Left Behind was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, having a one size fits all of how you educate our kids um, mm -hmm. was was an issue. And so we passed Every Student Succeeds Act. Now there's still issues with it, and not everybody is completely happy. But the reality is, it's going to give it's going to give power to the local school districts, right, to, to educate their kids. Right. Um, 
outcome the way they see fit because as Melissa's presentation show, what you need in San Diego is very different than what you need in Sonoma. And what you need in, in Eagle Pass, Texas is different than Dallas. Um, but my fear is um, as we move into the implement implementation phase that the states are going to take this and, and implement a one-size-fits-all solution across the state. And we can't do that. And so this kind of information and conversations with our state legislators and the state entities um, that are going to be implementing the, the ESSA Act, um, making sure that they don't fall into the same trap that we did with, with previous iterations. Um, one of the things that we're also working on, in, you know, uh, <coughs> There are some bright spots, right? I, I represent a town called Presidio. Mm -hmm. Presidio is, is one of the poorest districts in Texas, um, but there is a group of kids that um, created a, a, the rocket, a rocket school, a rocket program, and they ended up competing with private schools here in Washington, D.C., and nobody thought that a bunch of poor kids um, on the border were going to be able to, one, get a rocket to fly over 800 feet in the air, let alone compete with, with some of the, the top schools across the country, and they did. And the, uh, one of the girls in that school, she's graduating with 37 credit hours mm -hmm. um, because of the dual, dual credit, credit program. Yeah. And so making dual credit accessible to more schools um, is, is incredibly important. Possibly being able to get Pell Grant funding to allow some of these kids to do dual credit. So you cut down the cost of education by going into school with, with a better, with, with, with more, you know, you want to take two years because you're going in almost as a, as a junior. Um, but the reality is, is we got to make sure the counselors, we got to make sure the administrators, the teachers at these schools understand that path to wherever that kid wants to go. Great, great. Um, let me uh, go back to Rebecca. Um, the El Paso, I think uh, the congressman just alluded to something. Paso, um, Juarez, and southern New Mexico region is uh, three states. And um, each of these different states has totally different education systems. Um, the presence of the maquila or manufacturing firms in the Juarez area is uh, great. I mean, it's it's 60 percent of, of, of the total uh, labor pool. So with that presence, and you mentioning STEM, um, in our Juarez area, we, we've created councils uh, in each of these three areas to attain and address uh, workforce needs to education needs. Uh, when you mentioned in your presentation that you were doing STEM, some of these uh, Fortune 500 companies are really uh, putting up a lot of funding for the STEM areas. Now, uh, because they're centered or they're located in what is, uh, do you, or with your experience in this binational world and what you've been doing, do you foresee anything like that happening uh, that we could capitalize those fundings in the Fortune 500 uh, and really uh, set up STEM education on not only the water side, but also on the American side, so that we can have kids go back and forth. And I'm not talking just about kids, I'm talking about uh, college graduates. I think some of these college graduates have not even seen a twin plant across the border. So we have an asset that we really do not capitalize because of restrictions on the border. But you that can move back and forth these students, um, can you give us some insight as to how possibly some of these ideas might come to fruition? Yeah, sure. And I think Lydia, you should also share what you do because she, <laughs> she does a lot of work in the in that region, uh, particularly working with with the maquiladoras, etc. So you should also share the good work that you guys are doing. Um, Thank you. But I would mention three things that, that at the foundation we are doing, general topics that we are flank, frankly not doing necessarily in the border, but, but I think that could be applied everywhere and across both countries. And, and they can apply to STEM, which is what we are doing, but maybe also to other things. And one of them is, is mentorship. Um, we believe that, uh, and, and the data shows it both at the border and across the nation, that many of our uh, Latino students in the US are themselves first generation, the first person in the family in attempting to graduate from college or the first generation. And in many cases, they come from humble backgrounds and 
in many cases they don't have in their family the support system, the network of contacts that can guide them through the process of a job interview uh, or, or applying to college even before applying to the, to the job, right? Um, so at the foundation we have focused significant efforts on, on mentoring programs. Um, and I'll mention quickly two programs. One of them is it's a STEM mentoring program. And it's actually for Mexican high school girls um, that reside in the state of Puebla and other five states in Mexico. And it's a program in collaboration with the New York Academy of Sciences and the Mexican girls who participate in this program that we operate in Mexico form um, are, are, are part of an international group. So it's actually an international program. Mexico is the largest international co cohort, but it's an international program. So that's one example of how I think collaboration can happen between the US and Mexico in terms of in this case, the particular case of this program, Mexican girls benefiting from getting actual personal mentorship, both from Mexican professional females as well as uh, potentially also American uh, professional females. So that's one example. Another example of a program that we are also doing in the area of mentorship it's a program designed and run by the U.S. Mexico Foundation, which we launched last year, and it's called 1,000 Dreamers, 1,000 Leaders. The idea of this program is, again, to empower the young Mexican and Latino uh, youth in the U.S. so that they can achieve their, their full potential. And through this program, what we do is, is um, to connect uh, people like you, actually, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to sign up, but what we do is to connect um, successful professionals uh, of Latino or not Latino origin, but professionals with experience in, in the US, uh, we connect them one-on-one -on -one with a young, a young dreamer, a young uh, Latino student who is again trying to graduate from college and most likely is the first one in his or her family. Uh, in addition to connecting them, uh, we give them online training. So we give them training on, on how to um, training so that they stay in college. There, as you all know, there is a significant dropout rate among Latinos in the first two years of college. So we support them so that they stay in college. And then for those who are already in the third or fourth grade, uh, we give them uh, training on communications, on leadership development, on job search, etc. And we also organize networking events. So with the intention of, of building a community of individuals that support each other, a community of individuals that understand the challenges that the young students face, uh, because maybe some, many of the mentors uh, went through those same challenges when they were younger. Um, so that's one thing, mentoring, that I think it's something that can work very well across the border. Uh, and, and another example of how I think we can, we can support these communities uh, is uh, and across the border is through sharing of best practices and sharing successful models. So for example, in the US, there is an educational program called Teach for America that I'm sure you all know about, a program through which uh, we do not only uh, support uh, uh, schools uh, and support students and, and staff at the schools, but furthermore, we develop social leaders, right? I mean, people who go through this program for two years and then after graduating from the program, they go off with their professional lives and they build themselves NGOs, they, uh, they, they join Corporate America, etc. Uh, <laughs> but they have already in their minds and their hearts this this thing that they learn ab about being being a teacher in a in a public school in some remote place, um, and and that teaches them a lot. Um, so what we did at the foundation was to take this model and and take it to Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, it's called Enseña por México. It's in the third year of operation. Very successful program who continues to grow uh, and and with a lot of momentum and attracting support from many areas. We provided seed funding for it and strategic advice. That's another way in which I think uh, governments can collaborate. I mean, taking successful models who have proven to be successful in the US in the era of education and 
and taking them to Mexico. And then I would also say, on the other hand, um, the American education system, uh, going back to the fact that 50% of uh, students in California are of Latino origin, 71% of them speak Spanish, I think there is also an opportunity for the U.S. Uh, system to learn about Mexico. Uh, and one example of that, it's another program that we launched at the foundation. Sorry, it sounds like promotional, but, but it's just have to tell you what I know and that's what I know what we are doing <laughs> so so another program that we launched last year it's uh, it's called um, aulas uh, um, aulas in fronteras or or classrooms without a border and and through that program what we are doing is taking core members from teach for America to Mexico to teach at public schools in Mexico and then we take the core members from Mexico to teach in public schools in Mexico in the US and and through that program besides empowering the teachers themselves or core members themselves because it's certainly a professional development experience besides doing that we are also uh, given in the case of the US schools opportunity to have access to someone who really understands their students. Those students that you portrayed in the graphs that speak 71% uh, Spanish, but only 24% have crossed the border, they live in the US, but at home they speak Spanish, at school they may speak both. Um, they live in a Mexican culture, even though they are here, etc. And in many cases, our school system in the US doesn't have enough teachers who really understand that culture and consequently can serve those, those students. So through this program, again, by national program and through this experience of taking the Mexican teachers to teach uh, alongside the Americans at the US, uh, what we hear is that the American teachers say, wow, now I understand why my student behaves in this or, or that way, because now you're telling me this is what it's happens culture. at home. <laughs> it's a cultural thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other hand, on the Mexican side, the, the Mexican teacher says, wow, now I learned how to control my group because before they were all standing up and not listening to me, right? So now I learn uh, best practice in terms of how to make the classroom more interactive or whatever. So those are just three examples of um, mentoring and, and sharing uh, successful models that I think are uh, opportunities <coughs> to collaborate at a binational level. We are doing it at the foundation with significant success, but I think there is a lot more opportunities to do a lot more of that. L Lydia, Go ahead. Can I, can yes, I absolutely. Add, add to, to some of the things that Rebecca is talking about, um, Toyota and San Antonio, um, a lot of companies recognize now that their HR pipeline mm -hmm. starts at high school. Absolutely. And that they have to start applying, uh, um, getting internships, getting high school kids into their, their businesses, understand what they're doing, inspire them to go into some of these STEM cells, and that's going to produce that employee that they may need to fill the gap. And um, Toyota has a great program. You know, they're operating on, on both sides of the border, and they're dip, building that pipeline earlier. <coughs> uh, Laughlin Air Force Base, the Air Force Base in Del Rio, Texas, um, on the border with Acuna, produces more pilots than any other facility in the United States of America, yet they have a sort shortage of people to fix these planes. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They had to restart reaching out, and they're reaching out to high school kids, getting high school kids on the tarmac, fixing that plane that some F-15, soon-to-be F-15 pilot is going to learn how to fly in. And this is how they're solving that. And, and what Laughlin's starting to do is we're working with them to create a magnet school on the, on the, the base um, in order to provide um, education to, to the local community. So, so recognizing that the w that your pipeline, that these businesses recognize a pipeline is, is large and the opportunities that we do have on both sides of the border to get those real-world skills at a young age to make sure that they're going on to the next step to be to be prepared for those jobs of the future. Well, thank you. And um, uh, if I could just add something, and, 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 and this is something that to me is very close and I'm very passionate about it, I think it's also for, we also need to, and we are doing it at the foundation, when we talk about empowering Latino students here, particularly Mexican students, I think it's also very important to make sure that we put Mexico slash cultural background, uh, cultural heritage, richne richness of cultural heritage in their minds and their hearts. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, but, but just 
uh, in my case, sorry for sharing personal experience, but in my case, I was able to build a successful professional career in the US. And frankly, I believe in, in, in many ways, just because I hold on to my background and my heritage and my Spanish and my bilingual, bilingual and binational um, uniqueness, if I may say it, which is really not unique because there is a lot of us, but, but, that, but that helped me a lot. And I think what, I mean, in many cases with our young Latinos, um, we, don't, we don't tell them that enough. Like in many cases, um, and we see it through the programs and I'm sure, you, I'm sure you have all seen it, sometimes they, in their effort to make it in America, in their effort to achieve their dream, they forget about the richness of their heritage. And more importantly, they don't think about the opportunity to leverage that heritage that they have for their own professional development. Um, so I am very passionate about this, about making sure that uh, to our young Mexican community or, or American community of Mexican origin in the US, again, we put in their hearts and minds the, the value of their heritage so that they can, each one of them, use it for their own professional development, which subsequently also benefits the US, uh, the development of the US and the improvement of the binational relationship. Excellent. Um, there is one area that um, the workforce uh, currently and also education uh, relies on non-border issues, which is entrepreneurship. And uh, I would uh, love to have um, a colleague of mine just stand up. And if you could please, uh, uh, Mr. Mora is here with us from Juarez. He has a, a model uh, that is uh, just starting or has started about two years ago on entrepreneurship across the border. And he works closely with El Paso. So this is going back to Rebecca's uh, story saying um, of, of models, of capitalizing on models. We talked about technology. He's developing that for both sides of the border. So if you don't mind, Mr. Mora, just for a couple of minutes so that we can open it up for questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Well, as Lydia said, I'm, um, I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Technology Hub in Ciudad Juarez. And what we're doing is that we took over an old U.S. consulate in Ciudad Juarez uh, where, they ch where they did millions of visas for 35 years. And we're going to convert that into changing millions of families and lives through technology and innovation. And we're changing the narrative of people in Ciudad Juarez and in the region to be able to have a possibility and an opportunity to do something in the U.S. Um, we're excited about doing that. And that's one of the reasons we're participating today. And uh, we have different programs. We have a program called Kids to Code from 7 to 15 years old. And uh, they start learning how to code, how to do ro robotics. Um, it's an eight-week program. We have a boot camp that is uh, 17 to 99 years old. And uh, anybody that wants to join it, basically we do design thinking, value proposition design, um, you know, customer discovery. And we start teaching them all these new methodologies to, to go out to market. Uh, we also have, uh, we're building a fab lab. Um, in the in the in, in the space, we do have a linkage to all the universities in Ciudad Juarez. We are privately funded by five companies locally from Ciudad Juarez that believe that change comes from grassroots, not from the government. We'd love to get government help, but we have found that it's very difficult in Mexico to believe in this type of entrepreneurship. Um, as well as the five entities, we have an NGO that's working with us on the educational programs. And we're excited to bring this to our region. So we're trying to, to, to build the ecosystem. We do have a small satellite office in El Paso, Texas as well. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. So I'm excited to do that. So it's, it's a different form of education. As we know, the world is flat. And education is available to anybody through their cell phone. And, uh, and we're collaborating with, with all efforts on both sides of the border to make that happen. Thank you, Mr. Mora. Thank you. And now I would uh, like to open the floor for questions, uh, if there are any. In the back. Um, my name's Mari Smith. I'm here with U3 Advisors. I work in the city of Chula Vista, working um, on 
developing a, a, a center that would be both for uh, advanced workforce development and education. So first off, fantastic panel. Uh, this whole day has been great and this panel has been completely invigorating. Um, I uh, agree, Melissa, I, I thought your point about you can't separate education and workforce development from economic development. I, I can't say anymore. I think that was perfectly articulated. Um, Councilman heard uh, the fact that there is no one size fits all for education system. Absolutely. Um, so I'd pose this question to all three of you. Um, if, if we're saying it, it's not a one size fits all, but we want to connect uh, workforce development with education and with, work, uh, with economic development, um, how, how do we look at it not as a state by state issue? How do we look at it in terms of the entire border region, both sides of the border, um, to really connect business, um, any type of industry with institutionalizing that type of education and workforce development? Thank you. Anybody want to take a crack at it? Well, I'll I'll start. I, so, I think you I think you got to start small and go big, right? I, I think you have to start with that ind that individual school, that principal, or that superintendent for a district that has an idea for for the schools under their control, and and we're trying the federal government is trying to give them the flexibility to do that and adjust it as they see fit because you have a different um, ecosystem um, in that area, and so and distance is is an issue as well. So you're not going to be able to get kids, you know, traveling, you know, several hours a day to one a different location um, in order to take advantage of it. So we have to make sure that our superintendents and our school boards and the principals are prepared to incorporate these things. Um, we also need to make sure that the private sector educates our, 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 our leadership of these schools as what the future needs are. Because the reality is this, the, the kind of technological change that we're going to see over the next 20 years is going to make the last 20 years look like pale in comparison. And so we're having to educate our kids for jobs that do not exist right now. And, and that's for our, our, our private sector friends um, to, to make sure that, they, that these, these schools get that. And there has to be a, a plan individually at each of these locations because everything is different. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to jump in just because we're doing, uh, and Melissa, you want to go first? And then, no, no, no. Um, in, um, as I stated, in our region, there's three states. And so you have three different education systems. Um, we have decided that on the Mexican side, because there is a strong presence, PK-12, of a union, and there's a change going on in Mexico, we would delay um, addressing certain pipe, uh, education pipeline PK-12 problems uh, to later. So we started with the workforce initiative. And what we did is that we literally um, have the manufacturing firms lead the way on everything with the education institutions. So the education institutions really if they want to dance along with the manufacturing sector and align all these things and get funding, they need to they need to listen to them. So that was on the Mexican side. Uh, we will we have been trying to address PK twelve. It's going to take a longer time just because the system is different. On the U.S. side, you've got Southern um, New Mexico and Texas, pretty similar things. But uh, there we're addressing the pipeline as Congressman heard, you just you know heard him say what is happening in that area. So uh, different issues, different funding mechanisms. Uh, on the US side, you got a lot of foundations. On the Mexican side, you got private and a couple of foundations that we found. But there's different ways that we are approaching the same problem, which is workforce development. But you can't really cater the same uh, model to the three areas and, and we're just we're joined by the hip I mean we're, literally you go to New Mexico in like 10 minutes uh, and you've been there and and you're in what is like in two you know and so it, it's the same community so I, I don't know if I've answered part of the questions I, I just wanted to, to, to chime in and tell you what we're doing in our part of the world my, my two cents on that would be I mean in the question of like uh, uh, local versus versus no local I would say um, that it, that it's it, it's about the what versus the how, right? I mean, I think that maybe the what could be standard 
right? And should maybe apply to everybody. Uh, and maybe there should be some specific skills that all kids should learn, example, coding or things like that. Um, and I think there should be some metrics associated with being able to measure the, the accomplishment of teaching those basic skills or not. But then in terms of the how, I think every region is different uh, every in many ways. So, so I think it goes back to the what versus the how. The what maybe should be standard and the same to make sure everybody gets the same education, but the how definitely different to provide uh, freedom to the different locations to do it in whatever they think is the best way. I would just add, I think the points about cultural heritage and about skills are, are very important, but perhaps the easiest thing to, to help young people with is language. And we have uh, many students speak both languages and they go back and forth for, for their schooling, but they tend to lose their literacy in, in languages as they, as they go back and forth. And so for a border economy that works in both English and Spanish, I think one of the most basic things that we should be doing for young people is making sure that they're literate in both languages and that as they transition back and forth from school on one side of the border to the other, they don't lose that ability. Um, on many occasions, we heard from students who had grown up going to school in English, who had gone to Mexico, struggled to get their Spanish up to par so that they could go to school in Spanish, and then ended up going back to the U.S. for high school, then far behind where they were when they left in, in English because they're losing literacy as they go back and forth. And that's certainly something that we should be able to help our students with along the border. Well, thank you very much. I, am, uh, I thank each of you. And a round of applause for the panel. Thank you very much. So we've reached the end of our day. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be here and take part in this conference this year. I hope that you'll be here again with us next year. Thank you to all three of our panelists. I would want to say one special thanks to Congressman Hurd because we had actually invited him to participate in the policy discussion earlier in the day. And he came back and he said, no, I want to talk about education. This is an issue that really matters to me. And so I think it's a really uh, cool, admirable thing that you uh, wanted to dive into some of the issues in more detail with us. So thanks for doing that. And again, thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. We should take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> really nice to meet you as well. I'd love to learn more about some of the things that you're working on.